I have taught John before. So today, John and we'll, uh, I think I have one through four, uh, just we're not going to get into much of a study of those verses. Most of what we do today will be more on an introductory level um, because I want to find out the character of the individual uh, before uh, we find out what he wrote. Um, it's important, again, and, and we've, uh, in book of Hebrews, I was constantly hammering away on context. Context, context, context. Kind of look at things in their context. We have four Gospels uh, in our Bibles, and then the book of Acts. The Gospels were more of a synopsis of Christ uh, and the, uh, on his life. Uh, on while well, incarnate, uh, the book of Acts is a history of the church, but the letters and the gospels were are the letters that were written by Paul and Peter and James and Jude and and John. Those letters that were written bring together doctrinal facts that are taken from the life of Christ. The book of John is a, a different book. The book of John is not a synoptic gospel. It does, it, it deals with a different time frame uh, than the other gospels. Uh, he, he does, uh, no, he has no remarks about the birth of Christ. Um, and John, well, let's just go to the beginning a little bit. John is um, a son of Zebedee and Salome, he is a, a fisherman. He's a young man. Somewhere, some believe, around 10 years younger than Christ. Probably the youngest of the apostles. Um, uh, and when you... I, when I was looking for pictures to put in the book, like I, this is one of the old books that... Charlie has that I put for the uh, Hebrews when we were studying Hebrews and I like to put a little picture to kind of give you a glimpse of you know what the character might look like and wow what the pictures of John varied so much I mean there were pictures of him that looked like a girl with curly hair and all just wimpified and I'm like oh, whoever whoever painted this picture. I hope somebody didn't pay him for it. I mean, it just it makes you sick. John was a fisherman. Anybody ever watched Deadliest Catch? You know, uh, these are not wimps. Fishermen were, I mean, just uh, as we find the introduction where Jesus calls them, they're pulling a net full of fish. Now, I don't know about you folks, but uh, that's heavy work and, and strong work and, and work with your hands. I mean, these were masculine, strong-willed individuals. Um, and we find that John, um, the first time that we see John, oh, let's, let's do this. Let's get in and read a few verses, and then we'll come back and we'll get a little better idea. Uh, this book of John my greatest fear is not giving you um, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, I, I want to do the book justice. I want you to see John the way that I see John. I want you, to, as you study and you open up the book of John and you and you study it I want you to taste the honey that comes from his lips and his pen as he writes these words John looks at Jesus in a totally different light than the other apostles John looks at Jesus as almighty God he begins the book and he ends the book in that fashion. So when you're looking at John, you're looking at Jesus is 
God. Now, John was a writer. Um, John was a Hebrew. He was a Jew. Um, he was, um, uh, his mother was the sister of Mary, which made Jesus and John cousins. Uh, so they would have known each other as children. There would have been parties or, or events where the family, the families back then were very close. Actually, when I was a child growing up, they were close. I mean, we didn't wait for one time a year to have a family reunion. It, it might just happen on any given, any given weekend where the whole family come in from Kansas City and other areas and, and Grandma would go out there and wring the head of a couple chickens and off we would go. Um, I mean, that was, you know, you'd have a, a family reunion right then. They knew one another is what I'm trying to say as children. The difference between John and Jesus, of course, is Jesus was unique. He was an ordinary boy, worked hard with his father in the carpentry business. Um, but Jesus never cried because he was, wanted something. Um, Jesus never lied. He would have, some might have been jealous of him because he was the perfect child. Now, I know some people think they have the perfect child, but believe me, nobody has the perfect child. You understand? I mean, <laughs> nobody has the perfect child. But Jesus was the perfect child. And he and John and James and, and, and probably Andrew and, and them, they probably all knew one another at, at, at some time in, in their life. Uh, and, and they grew up together. Uh, John was the perhaps as young as 10 years younger than Jesus. So James, his brother, may have known Jesus a little better than he did. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, but when we, when we open up the book and we begin to read these first, well, I, the first verse... We could spend the rest of eternity on the one word in this first verse and never scratch the surface of all the meaning that is entailed within that one word. This book is like honey that flows down a, a, a honeycomb that is there for you and I to gather and to, to uh, any time we want to gather pieces of it. It's not like reading a, 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 just a book off the shelf. It is a book that reveals the deity of Jesus Christ. In every word throughout the book, he is directing people to Jesus is God. He wrote the book many years after the other apostles. The, but the very first verse says, In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, the, the Word. And we're going to spend a time on that. I don't know if I'll get to it today. But we're going to spend some time on these first verses, uh, which will get us into uh, the, the book. And the Word was with God and the Logos, the Word, was God. Amen. If your Bible don't have it exactly like that, I would suggest get one that does. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know what's sad? I was thinking the other day, I was, I was talking to some kids, and they're, we have a different religion going on today, it seems like. It's, it's like... The old King James Bible thumpers, pastor mentioned a lot on Wednesday night about, you know, generations of preachers passing away. Well, there's a generation of preachers that are passing off the scene right now. Uh, the old King James Bible thumpers are, are passing away. 
Uh, you go to many churches today and, and they found a place in the back, some, some little auditorium off to the side where uh, some old preacher can go up and preach to the old people. But the inside is where they have the entertainment and the kids with the new, new, brand new Bibles that, that uh, you know, and just get rid of the old Bible thumpers and eventually they'll die off and then you're going to have a new generation of people. That's, that's, uh, that's sad. I, I don't, I don't want to see that. But it's happening, and we've been watching it happen over centuries, and about every 50 years you'll see a group that pass away. I love to read biographies. John, when he wrote this, was somewhere close to 90. I put 98 A.D. He could have been, he could have been 85 years old when he wrote this uh, book. And... And I love to read biographies, but it always amazes me when I'll see some 13-year-old girl or 13-year-old boy that accomplishes something in their life, and somebody writes a biography about a 13-year-old. What do they have that I want to know about? But then you look at Moody and, and, and uh, Spurgeon I mean, go back and look at Luther and look at Calvin and look at Wesley and look at the Whitfields and and go back and look at the missionaries and get biographies of the old missionaries and and the pioneer works that they did. Uh, uh, Just uh, great men of God that accomplished great things for God. So when I read something, I like to read something from somebody that knows what they're talking about and has experienced it in their life. One of the beauties of the Gospel of John is the Gospels that were of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are great Gospels, and they have their place. Matthew was writing to the Jews and presented Jesus Christ as the King of Kings. Uh, Luke was writing and, and presented uh, Christ as the Son of Man, uh, at Mark the Suffering Servant. Luke had all the way the genealogy all the way from Adam. Uh, uh, and so these all had a purpose. They were, they were younger men. But when you come to the Gospel of John, we're talking about a man in his 80s who had been through the war. I would love to sit at the feet of John when he preached to the churches. I would love to hear the words as they flowed from the lips of the Apostle John. We have five books of his, and, uh, and they're, they're quite interesting. But John was just a young pup, uh, uh, and, and when Jesus came on the scene, John had, had studied and had somehow come into contact with John the Baptist, who was there all within a family, and, and he studied under John the Baptist. John is the only one that, uh, and he and, and his brother James, uh, John is the only one that writes about the introduction of Christ to the world by John the Baptist. He was there. He was there when Jesus walked up and John said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Young John, ten years younger than Jesus, knew about Jesus, but this was the introduction to the Lamb of God. And James and John were standing there when John the Baptist introduced Jesus to the world. Wow. And later we find John and James were fishing, and Jesus comes up and, have you guys caught anything? And they said, no, there ain't nothing out here. <laughs> and, and he said, well, throw your net on the other side. And they couldn't even, they had to call Andrew and, and, uh, and Peter over uh, and, and their boats. And I mean, they were all out there hauling in the fishes. And it was at that time that Jesus said, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. 
What a, what a, what a great introduction to the Son of God. As we're going to study this book, we're going to hear... You, you, right now, if you just think about it. Matter of fact, we probably have the Gospels of John in Spanish and, and English in the back somewhere. Do you understand that the Gospel of John multiplied millions, hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of the Gospel of John has been produced and sent around the world in almost every language? The Gospel of John. That's all you need is the Gospel of John. And you take the Gospel of John and the book of Romans and the book of Hebrews, and wow, you, have, you don't need a library full of doctrinal books teaching you a theology. You have it all right there. Uh, just, just an awesome, awesome book. So John's a younger brother of James. Um, I don't know how much difference he was than Peter because John and Peter hook up and become close friends. And I think because they were more closer to age. Andrew was older and James was older. And so I think that Peter and John were perhaps more of the same age. Um, we know that... Uh, uh, that uh, and we t I've talked about the, the meeting at the fishing. Uh, Peter always looked at the official character of Christ and asked what he and the other apostles should do. But John, being younger and eager to learn, gazed steadily at the person of Jesus and was intent to learn what the Master said. As we study the we study about John and we follow John with Jesus. He's just a pup. He's just a youngster. He's in his 20s. Jesus is 30. And, and John's just young, you know. But there's one thing that we learn about John. Wherever Jesus was, John was close to him. He was close to him. One place we find where the Bible says he was leaning against uh, Jesus' bosom. Now that does not mean what wicked minds think today, that, that he was laying against Jesus. That means he was setting closest to Jesus. You understand that? Try to get these kind of things in your mind because we have evil pictures of people what want to paint out there. All that means, remember the, the, the poor man was in the bosom of Abraham? He wasn't in the bosom of Abraham. He was sitting next to Abraham. He was close to Abraham. So understand, whenever Jesus went in to have supper, or wherever Jesus went, young John, this little kid, this 20-year-old man, young John would run in ahead and he would, wherever Jesus sat, John was next to him. Why? He wanted to hear every word that flowed from the lips of Jesus. He wanted to hear every word that flowed from the lips of Jesus. One time Jesus had sent the apostles out and said, Go into this Samaritan village and tell him I'm coming. And let's prepare a place for me. Prepare a place to eat and a place where we might rest for the night. And they sent some disciples out to this Samaritan village and they come back and said, these people don't want you there. You know what James and John said? Let's do like Elijah and call fire down from heaven and destroy that village. And Jesus called them sons of thunder. That's John, the one we think of as the loving apostle. He was a powerful apostle. The sons of thunder. He and James, I mean, they were ready right then to say, just like Elijah, call fire from heaven and destroy the village. And he, I believe they thought he could do it. And Jesus looked at him, you don't know what you're from. You know, this is a different, this, we're not Elijah, you know. 
we're here for love and grace. And that's what Jesus brought, love and, and grace. So when we look at the Apostle John, we see a young man that he wanted to hear everything the Savior had to say. He was a part of the three, Peter, James, and John. Every, whenever Jesus set himself apart, he might take those three men to be with him. So it's not a shock that when all of the apostles deserted Jesus at Calvary, it's not a shock to find John at his feet where he always was, close as he could get with Jesus' mother, giving her comfort and strength as they watch him shed his precious blood. And Jesus looks out at, his, at John and said, Behold thy mother. And mom, behold thy son. And from that day forward, John took her until she died, I'm assuming, uh, and cared for her and ministered unto her. John's mother was with the group of ladies that always followed Jesus around and made sure they had food to eat and took care of them as they went. John's mother was the last at the cross and the first at the tomb. So she was quite a gal in herself. Now imagine, just to think for a moment and imagine, you're the owner, you're Zebedee, and he has a, a fishing, fishing business, and Jesus takes both sons away. And then imagine the guys that, that Peter and, and Andrew's father, and they lose those two boys from the fishing fleet. That's quite a, that's quite a loss, don't you think, uh, that, they, that they might lose. So John, the gospel, is going to be an interesting book. Um, <clears throat> after the death of Christ, we see the disciples in the upper room uh, and where they had received power. Remember Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8 says, Ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. That verse was actually fulfilled in, uh, in Acts chapter 2, Jerusalem, Acts chapter 8, Samaria, Acts chapter 10, Judea in Acts chapter 19, the uttermost parts of the world, and it's still going on today. Uh, but it, in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 12 is when these apostles received that power of God, and, and John was there. Uh, it says, but uh, let me see here. We find also after that, that John has, has now gained a little bit of age, not, not much. It's, Christ has died. Uh, he is now ministering with Peter. Somehow they connected together and, and they became a team. Uh, remember James was the, the older brother. And Peter and, and, and uh, um, uh, John uh, connected. They were going into the temple one time. And, and as they were going in, there was a lame man there, and they healed this lame man. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Uh, the guy rose up and walked and jumped and kicked his heels. And, and, uh, uh, and in the next verse, uh, in chapter 4, uh, they had to... They had to witness, they witnessed to the, the rabbis, the priests, to, of what they did. And, and what they say here in, in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 19 through 20, says, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than unto God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things that we have seen 
and heard. What things had they seen and heard? They walked with Jesus for three years. They've watched him do the things. You know, it's got to be difficult. It has to be. This had to be difficult. We, you and I, we, we come together on Sunday and we fellowship and, and, and all and, and um, talk to one. When they were with Jesus, he was, a, he was, he eat, he spoke, he suffered pain, uh, he, uh, he had, I mean, he was a human every bit as much as everybody else was human. Right? So that had to be difficult for the apostles to, to they saw him do miracles, and now he's God, but he's just like them. He's human. He's God, and he's human. He's God, and he's human. It had to be a difficult thing for them to take the two apart. And when Jesus died, Peter went back to fishing. It's over. It's done. Now what? Well, what happened? He rose again. <laughs> That's a pretty good deal. And then not only did he rise again, but he was with them for some like 50 days. And he was seen over 500 people at one time. And then he grows off into glory. Everything changed at the resurrection. Everything changed at the resurrection. And so Peter and John now have, are, are given the task of, of being preachers of the gospel and giving testimony uh, to Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 8, I was talking about, the, you know, the Acts 1, 8, you know, that you be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Philip, remember Philip? Philip was a deacon. And nobody told Philip you wasn't supposed to go out and preach the gospel to all the creatures. So he went to Samaria and he began to preach the gospel in Samaria. And what happened? As Philip is preaching the gospel in Samaria, they got saved. Now the church in Jerusalem had a problem. They were Jews. They were Jews. Those people saved on the day of Pentecost, there's 3,000 Jews. Those people saved the next couple of days, 5,000 Jews. Those other people that were saved, multitudes, Jews. Those were Jews Jewish Christians. And Philip went out and won a Samaritan to Christ. Several of them. So what did the church at Jerusalem do? Well, they sent Peter and John to Samaria to check it out. And as soon as they got there, the people in Samaria witnessed or gave witness to the same testimony as what happened to them on Pentecost. I believe basically they, they spoke Hebrew to them and, let, and gave witness to their testimony that they trusted Christ as Savior. Well, what happened to Peter and John? Well, if you read the scriptures on the way back home, they, they had a revival. They started preaching the gospel throughout all of Samaria. Every, every town they went through, they stopped and preached the gospel all the way through to that. After that, we don't hear much about John. John kind of falls off the scene. In Acts chapter 12, his older brother James is slain. And he dies. He is uh, run through with a sword or he is uh, uh, beheaded. Uh, James is killed for his testimony for Christ. Um, Paul gave testimony. We hear about Paul talking about him in, in Galatians 2, 9. Paul says that he, get, he was given the, the power to do what he does, the fellowship of, of Peter, James, and John, and that Paul was to be a missionary or a witness to the Gentiles. But then he says something after that. He says, that Peter, James, and John were witnesses to the Hebrews. John was a missionary with Peter to the Hebrews. He preached 
to the Hebrews. That's what his ministry was. And so when we get into the book of John, we're going to see a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And so he is going to show about Christ looking at it in a Hebrew light. You understand what I'm saying? Luke, when he wrote, was a, was a Gentile, not a Hebrew. But John, in his writing, and even as we're studying the book of Revelation with the pastor uh, and this morning, the book of Revelation is Old Testament. It's just filled with Old Testament Hebrew. John was a Hebrew to the Hebrews. He preached to the Hebrews. And so, I don't know, those people that don't like the Old Testament are not going to like John. Because he was a Jew to the Jews. And, and so, uh, it's going to be a very, very interesting and a very good book. I've, there are several things in here that uh, I've written down in the notes uh, on the very bottom where I list each one of the chapters, uh, I made a mistake. There's 21 chapters. Um, and so at the very, very bottom of the last page, it says uh, uh, Jesus in chapter 20 is a victory over death. And chapter 21 is the restorer of the penitent, which is that of Peter. Uh, verse number one. In the beginning was the Word. When we look at uh, words, unless you dig into words, you don't always get the meaning of it. I have a concordance that is at my beck and call every moment of every day. I, if I have a word, a Bible word, simple words, like the other day we talked about trumpet, remember? And it, you know, once you look at it, it's, it's talking about a voice, a reverberating angry voice. The Bible says trumpet, but it's more than that. And so when we get into verse number one, in the beginning was the word, and we're, we're going to go into that a lot more, and we'll start next week in verse number one. This word is the word logos, and it is more than just word. It embodies a lot more than that. What this is talking about here is that it embodies all of the treasures of divine wisdom. Let, let me give you a, a, a hint. I mean, Paul wrote in, in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 24, he says, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. In Galatians 2, 2 and 3, he says, Understanding that to the knowledge of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So as we get into this word, it means more than just word. It means more than the voice of God. We, Christ embodies the deity of God. He embodies the deity of God. Look, look with me in verses 1 and, um, uh, well, we go through verse 3. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. Go to verse 9. That there was, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into 
the world. Go down to verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. He pitched His tent among us. And we beheld, we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we go on. Verse 15, John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of His fullness have we all received in grace for grace. For the law was given by, the, by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten, the only begotten, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him." Now, if we go to chapter 14 for just a moment. Chapter 14, and we'll look at verse number uh, 9 through 11. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, Show us the Father? You want to see the Father? See Jesus. See Jesus. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but of the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. So we're going to get into this next week, and we're going to see how John introduces us to the deity of Christ in the first words of, the, of his book. And that's going to be the theme throughout the whole book. Jesus is God. Amen. So, next week, I'll try to have some books for you. Uh, some of these... Uh, books and uh, I'll find a good picture where it's not girly and uh, we'll have we'll, we'll begin to get into the book of John as we go through it we'll begin to see more and more of John this is what I love about studying characters as you begin to see uh, that character in his words and that's going to be great Father, we love you so much. We thank you for today and pray that you'll bless us today. God be with us. God bless the pastor and encourage him and, and fill him with your spirit. Empower him in your words. Open our hearts and our minds that we might receive your words. In Jesus' precious name, amen.